recording and in your own time. So watch the screen, please. Hello, ladies and gents, boys and girls, cats, dogs, arachnids, and all you inanimate objects out there. Allow me to broadcast to you, the wonderful viewer. This is the power of Waset. I am JC Kamal. And this is a talk about ancient Egypt, what we know as ancient Egypt. Some people call it Kemet. Um, and within this, we will be unearthing mistruths that have been told to you throughout the years if you've been watching documentaries in Europe or America or mainly main, main, mainstream media. Um, within this talk, I will be speaking about um, ancient Egypt, Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, and the culture of, of the people that um, was there. Um, first, let me say, tell you why I decided to do this talk. One, I went to Egypt and I was mesmerized and amazed by the different um, objects and monuments that I saw. And I was like, you know what? I have to share this information with as many people as possible. Um, so this is why I'm, I'm doing this. But also, um, about a year ago, sadly, a friend of mine's son goes to Burlington Danes. We was having a conversation and he was upset due to the fact he felt there is enough black history in schools. So me being a doer rather than a cusser, let's say, um, I chose to get up and figure out a way of instilling black history to as many people as possible. So that is where this power of Waset talk come from. So how, where are we going to start? Um, I, a long time ago, throughout the years, I have been developing and acquiring knowledge um, one of which, one of the pieces of knowledge that I have acquired is a book called The Hermetica. You can start the video, please, Stinko. Um, the Hermetica is a book um, about ancient Egypt or from ancient Egypt, and it's got a lot of wonderful and spiritual writings within. Now, at one point, there is a passage that you are going to hear. It was very surprising when I read it, and I'm sure you'll be very surprised when you hear it. Also, of weighty importance is this discourse which I send to you, my king. It is so to speak a summing up of all the other discourses and a reminder of their teaching. It is not composed in accordance with the opinion of the many. It contains much that contradicts their belief. For my teacher Hermes often used to say in talk with me when we were alone, and sometimes when Tat was with us, that those who read my writings will think them to be quite simply and clearly written. But those who hold opposite principles to start with will say that the style is obscure and conceals the meaning and it will be thought still more obscure in time to come when the Greeks think fit to translate these writings from our tongue, Egyptian, into theirs. Translation will greatly distort the sense of the writings and cause much obscurity. Expressed in our native language, a, the teaching conveys its meaning clearly, for the very quality of the sounds, and when the Egyptian words are spoken, the force of the things signified works in them. Therefore, my king, as far as it is in your power, and you are all-powerful, keep the teaching untranslated in order that the secret so holy may not be revealed to Greeks, and that the Greeks' mode of speech, with its arrogance and feebleness and showy tricks of style, may not reduce to impotence the impressive strength of the language, 
and the cogent force of the words. For the speech of the Greeks, my king, is devoid of power to convince, and the Greek philosophy is nothing but a noise of talk. But our speech is not mere talk. It is an utterance replete with workings. So yeah, there you have it. Those Egyptians didn't really hold reverence for the Greeks. And they felt that the Greeks, um, it wasn't really about speaking their language. So that is why I am telling you some of, not all, some of the true words of the ancient Egyptians. Now, another thing that also happens is the Anglo-Saxonization of these words, where they used English to um, speak um, the different words. And I'm going to show you how that can be a major mistake. Um, if you continue on with the video. The ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for over 3,000 years and became one of the most powerful and iconic civilizations in history. At its height, ancient Egypt's empire stretched as far north as modern-day Syria and as far south as today's Sudan. But long before it was an empire, ancient Egypt was a series of small independent city-states that bloomed along North Africa's Nile River. The city-states were divided into two regions and named according to the flow of the Nile, Upper Egypt in the south, which was upstream, and Lower Egypt in the north, which was downstream. By about 3100 BC, the two halves united, thereby creating one Egyptian state that lasted for millennia. The reign of this civilization can be divided into three major periods of prosperity called the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, and two periods of instability in between called the First and Second Intermediate Periods. Guiding the Egyptian people was a succession of about 300 rulers, often referred to as pharaohs. Pharaoh, which means great house in Egyptian, was never the ruler's formal title. It only became synonymous with the ruling individual in modern times, thanks to its use in the Hebrew Bible. These rulers, who were not always men, nor Egyptian, were considered protectors of the people and served as divine liaisons between humanity and the hundreds of gods they worshipped. So, as you can see, this Moses um, is a name that we all know. We all know and love. We've heard Moses many a time. But people don't actually realize his, the actual name Moses means born of. Um, because when they found him, they, they didn't know where his, his family were from. And they didn't know where he was, his origins, his ethnic origins were. So, they decided to call him Moses which means, as I said, born of. Um, if you continue the video, that'd be great. So as you can see, as the video goes along, it will say born of, and that is the name of Moses. Now, Moses comes up quite a lot in Egyptian names, um, but a lot of people don't actually realize it's also raw Moses. As in Ramses. Now, Ramses the Great, we all know, um, many have heard of his Abu Simbel temples and what have you, but um, he is not the only one that uses Moses. There's Ar Moses, which means the moon, so he's born of the moon, and Tahuti, Tut Moses. Now, Tahuti is another name that people do not realize they're mispronouncing. In the English, you say you may say Foth, but in the African languages, they don't have the TH. They use, it's more a phonetic language, so it's actually Tahuti. Or, many of you have seen it in another famous Egyptian, as in Tut, or Tahuti Ankh Amun, as his actual name is, um, many people know him as Tutankhamun, but they misrepresent his name and who he is and what he stood for because 
um, it's actually Tehuti Ankh Amun. And if you break down the words, you get to realize the spiritual significance of this person, Tuhuti Ankh Amun. Now, moving on, carrying on with the video, we are now going to show you one of the reasons why the Ankh is so important. Because wherever you go, when you're walking around the top monuments and of Egypt, you see the Ankh prevalent. It's quite a lot. This was taken from Tutankhamun's um, burial chamber. And this is from um, the Temple of Kunsu. Um, as you can see, the pharaohs, the two gods are giving the pharaoh um, the onk, washing him with the onk. And that's Tahuti. That's the god I was telling you about. Um, now, we are going to see a video about the onk, so we can understand its spiritual significance. Keep going, Steam Co. What is the Ankh? The Ankh is a symbol of life according to the beliefs of the Kemites of ancient Africa. Known as the Key of Life or the Cross of Life, it dates to the early dynastic period, 3150 to 2613 BCE. It is one of the most recognizable yet misunderstood symbols in all the world. The Ankh is described by some as the Egyptian cross, despite the fact that it predates both Egypt and the cross itself by several thousand years. This symbol is a hieroglyph for life or breath of life, and as the Kemites believed that one's earthly journey was only part of an eternal life, the Ankh symbolizes both mortal existence and the afterlife. It is one of the most ancient symbols of the Kemites, often seen with the Dajjad and Wa symbols, carried by a multitude of Kemetic gods in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and worn by the Kemites themselves as amulets or charms and bracelets. The Ankh is perhaps the most enduring symbol of the Kemetic philosophy. The true meaning of this ancient symbol will spark vigorous debate even to this day. I will do my best to define my understanding. The Ankh is the symbol of eternal life. It represents both female energy with its crown and male energy with its shaft. It is in the combination of these two elements that we find eternal life. Still others will reference its visual similarity to the reproductive organs of a woman for its connection to life and to rebirth. The crown representing the womb, the two stems being the fallopian tubes, and the shaft representing the birth canal. The Ankh came into popular usage in Kemet and Nubia during the early dynastic period, coinciding with the rise of the cults of Asar and Aset. Aset is a mother goddess associated with fertility, but she is also the beloved wife who resurrected Asar after his murder at the hands of Chaos in the form of his brother Set. Aset became the most popular goddess in Kemet and Nubia, and all other gods were seen as mere aspects of this most powerful and all-encompassing deity. The cult of Aset promised eternal life through personal resurrection. In the same way that Aset had rescued her husband Asar from death, so she could rescue those who placed their faith in her. The association of the Ankh with such a powerful goddess embedded it with greater meaning, and now that it was linked specifically with the great goddess who could save and provide for one in the afterlife to come. During the New Kingdom period, 1570 to 1069 BCE, when the cult of the god Amon was increased in power and stature, the Ankh became associated with him. The Ankh was used in temple ceremonies regularly at this time and became associated with the cult of Amon and the royal family themselves. During the Armada period, 1353 to 1336 BCE, when Akhenaten raised the god Aten to the role of the sole god of Egypt, the Ankh continued its popular use under him. The symbol was still seen in paintings and inscriptions at the end of beams of light emanating from the solar disk of Aten, bringing life to those who believed in him. After his death, Akhenaten's son took the throne and reinstated the old religion, replacing the Ankh with the same meaning it had always held before. The Ankh also symbolized water in rituals of purification. 
we see in artwork the king standing between the two gods, one of whom was usually Thoth, as they, spo as they poured over him a stream of libations represented by the ox. The ancient gods of Kemet, Cush, and Nubia are often depicted as carrying ox symbols. We find the Ta, Satet, Sobek, Tefnut, Asar, Ra, Isis, Hathor, Anubis, and many other gods often holding the ox symbol, along with the scepter. The mortal genius Enotep, who became deified as the god of medicine, also became associated with the ox and its healing aspects. The loop itself is the perfect symbol of what has neither beginning nor end, and stands for the soul which is eternal because it springs from the spiritual essence of the gods. The possessor of this geometric key to the hidden mysteries of creation will be able to open the gates of the realms beyond and penetrate the hidden meaning of eternal life. Gods are depicted holding the ark to show that they themselves command the powers of life and death, and that they are truly immortal. The dead also carry the ark at times when their souls are being weighed or when they board the boat of the sun god, as at these times they are seeking the same immortality that the gods have shown them. Furthermore, the ark symbolizes a spring from which flow divine virtues and the elixir of immortality. Therefore, to hold the ark was to drink from that well. It was sometimes held upside down especially during funeral rites, and in these cases representing the key to entering the realm of eternity. Sometimes the ark is placed on the forehead between the eyes, and in these cases symbolizes the duty of the enlightened to keep secret the sacred knowledge to which he or she has been initiated. If one is blessed by the supreme vision, endowed with the clairvoyance to pierce the veil of fog to see the great beyond, he must guard this knowledge from the undisciplined. That the Ankh remains a highly visible symbol today is a testament to its enduring power and its connection to mankind. So, as you can understand now, why um, Tutankhamun is such a powerful and wonderful name that we must pronounce properly. Tuhuti Ankh Amun. So, if you could continue on with the video. Put it in the screen in the mix. Right me, like in the school business. Right, yeah. So next up, we will go going to go into um, Waset. No, Wajet is the actual name of the place. If the video comes on, just waiting for it to come on and moving my head. It's a bit I just stand and smile. Look pretty. I think there's a big gap here, Jason. There you go. Right, so Tamehu. Uh, Tamehu is the actual place, it's land of the papyrus, which is the actual name of Lower Egypt. Um, a lot of people do not realize that is the actual name of the place. Now, before it became part of the two lands, it was. Um, a place of different gnomes. The gnomes are the different place, the, the place, the names of the different places, let's say. Um, now, the w one that I want to focus on is Wajet, or Power Wajet, which is the house of Wajet. Um, house of also was Per A. Per A is the house of the moon, which later became Pharaoh. But moving on and going back to Wajet, she was a one of the major goddesses of this part of um, Egypt. So much so, the original culture that got taken over was the Wajet culture. Um, and at one stage, it, she was a major, major worshipped person or female deity. She was so much, so powerful that she, she became one of the Neti. Um, which is two, one of the people of the two lands, the females of the two lands. Um, and she was very worshipped, worshipped very well, very highly. Um, and she was a cobra-headed go goddess, 
and she was part of you know the Uraeus. You usually see the Uraeus on the top of the the heads of the um, pharaohs. Well, her head, um, her representation was the cobra because she was a cobra-headed goddess. Um, and when you see the um, the crown of Upper Egypt, it's a red crown with a coil coming out of it. That is um, because it was representing her, the female goddess, um, Wajet. Um, she was a powerful goddess. And another reason why I like to mention the female goddesses of ancient Egypt, because a lot of people do not realize that they were highly revered. There are many, many, many female goddesses in ancient Egypt. And um, Wajet was one of them. As I said, her helmet, or the hat that they all used to wear, all the pharaohs, was called the Deshret. And here you can see on Tutankhamun's um, headdress, you see um, it's representing the Nebti, so it's the two ladies, as well as the Ishtet, which is also called the um. oh, So Noms and Nomarchs are the actual names of the 20 regions of um, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Um, the Sepat is actually what it's the Egyptian name. Nome is the Greek name, and Sepat is the Egyptian name. Now, Nuit is the name of the place where it was like a little town where they would have Huit Niger, um, which is the main main temple, or or the um, main place of the Nomarch, who is the king of that region. You also had the White Rules which were um which was the name of memphis or one of two um cultures that merged and became one and it became menlefa which later um changed um to menfi and eventually it became um memphis and it was the per nefa so, Pernetha of Memphis, which is the main title, is the Huit Ka Ptah, which means the House of Ptah. Ptah is a major god, and eventually, uh, when the Greeks came in, they named it Egyptos. And Egyptos is what we now know as Egypt, ladies and gents. Um, so, as I said, Ptah was a major god, and when the Greeks came in, they had the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemy, Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic, I should say, because they're not meant to pronounce the T, that's how the Greeks messed up things. The Ptolemaic um, Greeks, they um, decided to use Ptah as in their names of the gods. And Ptah. as you did see briefly, Cal Cleopatra was probably actually Carleo Ptah Ra which means the spirit of Ptah Ra. So, now, let's have a video about Ptah, who is one of the main things in the gods of the Ogbed of Homopolis and the Enid of Heliopolis, and was given the epithet, he who set all the gods in the places and gave all things the breath of life. As a supreme creator of humankind, Ptah became the patron to all those who utilize spoken or written word in their duty. He is regarded as the ancient one. Sekhmet, the lion goddess, is his wife, and Nefertin, his son. And the three together form the Memphite triad. Ptah is the deification of the primordial mound in the Enid cosmology, called Tatanen, meaning risen land. It is said in Shabaka stone that it is Ptah who called the world into being, having dreamt creation in his heart and speaking it with his mouth. Ptah created himself when he spat out his own name and brought himself into existence, all by the power of word. This is what distinguished Ptah from most other gods because he created by his mouth. That which he uttered came into being. His power is believed to manifest itself in all living beings as a sound of one's heartbeat. Ptah fashioned the universe through harmonics and thought. 
He helps the dead on the travels to the afterlife, allowing them to transform into his divine form. The aqua school is his sacred animal, a representation of his ba or earth, which gives fertility and rebirth to all creatures. Atua, the sun god, was created by Ptah to rule over all creation, sitting upon the primordial mound. Ptah was worshipped throughout all of Kemet, but his cultural centers were in Memphis and Heliopolis. Ptah is the patron of sculptors, painters, builders, carpenters, and other craftsmen. And it is he who invented masonry, which he gifted to humans. His high priest is given the title Great Leader of Craftsmen, and his priests are linked to all types of crafts. And he, as I said, was a major, major deity in ancient Egypt. Later on, in the New Kingdom, he transformed due to language, as people forget that the, the Egyptian civilization lasted for thousands of years. So during that time, just like we speak differently to people a hundred years ago, things change. And um, um, Patar transformed into Amun, and a lot of people would, uh, would know Amun as in, as in Amun Ra. Um, so, moving on um, into uh, the people, as you can see, this in the documentary just now, um, you saw this image of Tutankhamun. Now, it's Tutankhamun dressed as Ptah because he was a highly revered um, deity. And as you can see, he's, he's holding the Ankh with a Jed Pillar staff. And those are also two major symbols. We already know about the Ankh, but you should also Google the Jed Pillar because it's a major. There's actually a Jed Pillar inside Khufu, which is uh, one of the pyramids in Egypt. So if you continue on um, with the video, Steam Call. Um, so as you can see, this is Tutankhamun. And as, if you look at his facial features, you will see that he's definitely not European. And another thing that you see when you go to um, ancient Egypt, you see um, a lot of the color coloration is in the um, skin tone is brown. And you, as you saw in that last picture, they do have white. Now this this is one of the two um, statues found in Tutankhamun's um, burial chamber. And as you can see, these are powerful black men. And these are from the the Cairo Museum, and as you can see, these are wonderful depictions of Egyptian people um, on boats, doing pottery, all kinds of wonderful depictions. I call it um, ancient um, murals, kind of. And as you can see, the cattle, um, and these are Nubian archers. Now, as you can see, there is a different skin tone. These Nubian archers are actually darker than the Egyptian archers. Um, and th th this shows they actually knew about skin tone and the differences and how to portray the different skin tones. Also, I'm showing you this. This is Akhenaten. As you can see, they are sun worshippers. This is three, three to four thousand years ago, long before sunblock. So they could not have been sun worshippers and being using sunblock at the same time. I, you, I missed out at um, Akhenaten, but I wanted to show you his lovely thin lips. As you can see, this is Queen Hatshepsut's temple. Um, as you can see, if you look at the skin on the faces, or the color on the faces, there's actually brown tonage from the way it hasn't been damaged by the sunlight. This is another African brother. You see his nose has been taken off, and this, this one shows his nose, what his nose looked actually with, um, with it out of being taken off. But as I was saying to you earlier on, um, they did know the different skin tones. And as you can hear, see, this is a lighter shade, a woman with a lighter shade, but she's not white. You can see that she's got a yellow skin tone, um, just like, uh, but unlike the, um, her robes, which are white. She is wearing white robes. So you can see that they d definitely had um, a difference and really the difference in skin tones and were a if and these are intelligent people 
So these intelligent people that were able to build the pyramids, if they knew the, the different skin tones and were able to depict it, don't you think they would do it how they look? A pharaoh would not want himself depicted a different way to the actual way he is. So these are some of, this shows you the culture and the people um, were most definitely of um, African descent. Um, and it's in Egypt, it's in Africa. People need to get away from this whole misrepresentation that you usually get in the news broadcast um, area, arena, I should say, when they say to you, Egypt is the Middle East. It is not the Middle East. Egypt is in Africa. Enough said. Um, moving on to, now we're going to go to Waset. Or and um, Waset is in Ta Ta Shimal, which is the actual name of Upper Egypt. Um, it means land of reeds, which is the actual name of Egypt. So show you there's a t separation between the, the two um, places. Now the place um, that we are going to focus on is Waset. Waset is the actual name of the place you know, majority of people know, as Thebes. Um, now, Thebes is not the, the name of the people, the people um, chose for themselves, because they were um, a, a cult of Set. Set is one of the gods of Egypt, and they, he was one of the um, people that they worshipped there. Um, Upper Egypt was divided into 22 lands. The first of these was around elephant time, close to Egypt's border with Nubia and the first cataract. Waset was, is what you know, now know as Luxor. Look at these wonderful pictures of the um, Nile in Luxor. And it was the fourth known or Sepat. Um, and it also included the Karnak Temple um, as we, if you don't know. Um, it was a, an ancient Egyptian city located along the Nile, about 800 kilometers south of the Mediterranean. Its ruins lie within the modern Egyptian city of Luxor. Thebes was the main city of the fourth upper e Egypt, and it was close to Nubia and the eastern desert with its valuable minerals, resources and trade routes. It was a cult center and the most venerated city of ancient Egypt during its heyday. The site of Waset includes areas both the eastern, on the eastern bank of the Nile, where the Karnak Temple sits, as well as places such as the Valley of the Kings. All of these special places, well-revered places, Edfu Temple as well, um, these places were actually in Upper Egypt, Waset. Now, when you're watching documentaries on Egypt, they will go right from the pyramids in Giza directly um, to Karnak without telling you there's a main... It took me nine hours by coach to get from one from Giza to um, Karnak. Um, it's a major, major, major journey. Wonderful journey, but it's a major journey. And it, um, where it shows you that there is a distance between the two places. Um, now, this is a crook and flail, which, um, as you can see, that is Akhenaten. He's holding one, and every king used to wear one before you saw um, Tutankhamun's burial. Um, crook and flail. Um, also, keep the keep it rolling. There's another place that people should know of um, and need to learn about. Um, it's a place called Neken. Um, in the first video that you saw, it was part of Upper Egypt. Now, Neken is the first one of the first cities in ancient Egypt, and it holds the oldest tomb and the oldest zoo ever to be 
found. Also, it holds the oldest painting as well. Now, one of the, as I said, there's always a new it that houses the main temple. And one of the main deities of Neken, for obvious reasons, is Nekbet. Now, she is another very important goddess that a lot of people fail and do not know about. Um, she was a vulture-headed goddess, as you can see. This is from the um, temple of Queen Hatshepsut, the um, screenshot that I took. Um, and yes, she is a vulture-headed goddess. Um, here is another picture from um, the temple of Queen Hatshepsut. Um, also, she was represented in the hat, similar to Upper e um, Lower Egypt in the Deshret. In Upper Egypt, she was represented by the Hejet, which is the white crown of Egypt. And you can see this wonderful black man wearing his white crown, because black people ruled in Egypt. Um, um, yeah, and so he the Hejet was the crown that w was represented also as a vulture. As you can see here on the headdress of Tutankhamun, she is um, also became part of the he Uraeus, um, the headdress, and it's the two kings, the two lands, the Neti, the queen of two, the two queens of the two lands. Now, to signify that there's two lands, they put it in their helmet. As you can see, this is Mentu Hotep, the second king, or uh, the second most important king of ancient Egypt. He brought in the new kingdom, which we'll find out, the middle kingdom, which we will find out in a moment, but as you can see, he has the red crown at the bottom and at the top, you can see it in the, this is from the Cairo Museum, he has the white crown. Now, when the two are united, it meant Sawa Tawi. So that was the actual name of the Pharaoh or every king of Egypt, uniter of the two lands, Sawa Tawi, not Pharaoh, Pharaoh came later on in the New Kingdom, and it was per a but throughout, they also had their own regional name, but throughout the whole of the Egyptian civilization, it was Seratari, and here is the hieroglyph that represents Seratari. You can see the loops, and he's got the two kings, and he's holding the loops over the civilizations. Now, we are going to find out about these, the three greatest kings of ancient Egypt, um, Norma, Mentu, Hotep, and Amosis, or Amosi. They were the three Wasetians, and this is why it's called the power of Waset, because these three kings who came from Upper Egypt, Ta Shemal, um, and subjugated the Lower Egypt, um, and became, and brought, became unifiers, united the two lands, and brought the two lands together, and which spawned the wonderful civilizations, um, the our old kingdom, the, the new centuries. kingdom, and of course the middle kingdom. With Upper and Lower Egypt developed at similar rates, but by the end of the 32nd century BC, increased trade with neighboring civilizations like Mesopotamia shifted the balance of power in Upper Egypt's favor. While Lower Egypt was sorely comprised of provinces called Nubs, several cities had already sprung up in Upper Egypt. They soon found themselves in need of more resources to satisfy their increasingly expanding urban areas. Nama, also known by their honorific title Menes, meaning he... No, he did not look like that. He was a lot darker, Egyptian as we know, Minis. but this is a European he documentary, so you have tribal to leaders, I which apologize. Egyptologists refer to as the Thenite Confederacy with the goal of mounting an invasion against the north. The group achieved total victory over Lower Egypt, uniting both lands in the process. Nama's story is told on the world's oldest discovered historical document, the Nama Palette. The palette is a two foot tall engraved piece of slate discovered in the ancient Egyptian city of Nekin, more commonly known by its Greek name, Hierakonpolis. The front of the palette depicts Nama as a tall man, sized hierarchically, wearing the hajet, or white crown of Upper Egypt, characterized by its bowling pin-like appearance. Nama is positioned above an enemy, grasping a lock of his hair in one hand and wielding a mace in the other, ready to smash his head. 
This stance is referred to as a smiting pose. It indicates victory and remained a common symbol throughout all of ancient Egyptian history. The small rectangle at the top of the palette, known as a serek, meaning facade in ancient Egyptian, identifies the tall man as Nama. The serek shows a palace facade containing two small figures within, phonetically representing Nama's name. The first figure is of a catfish, pronounced Na, and the second of a chisel, pronounced Mer in ancient Egyptian. These are some of the earliest hieroglyphic inscriptions ever discovered. Above the enemy is Horus, represented as a falcon, standing atop several papyrus flowers, the symbol of Lower Egypt. The falcon grasps a rope in his talons that's attached to an enemy's nose, indicating Nama's complete dominance over the Lower Egyptian people. Below them lay Nama's dead enemies. The story continues on the palette's opposite side, with Nama and his men marching in a procession, as its enemies lay naked, bound, and decapitated, with their heads placed between their legs. Once again, Nama's depiction is scaled hierarchically, emphasizing his godlike persona. However, he is now shown wearing the Deshret, or the Red Crown of Lower Egypt. The crown is characterized by its protruding coil, representative of a cobra. This is the first depiction of a single ruler wearing both crowns of Egypt. Below them, two men pull on ropes attached to mythological beasts with intertwining necks. The creatures are hybrids between serpents and leopards, called serpaparts. The design is thought to symbolize the union of Egypt's two lands. At the bottom of the palette, Nama is represented as a bull, demolishing the enemy's walls and trampling a vanquished foe. Another artifact relating to the first pharaoh, and also found in Hierakonpolis, is a decorative mace head made of limestone, commemorating the unification of Egypt called the Nama Mace Head. It shows Nama on a throne, wearing the enemy's red crown, and being presented with treasure and captives. At the bottom of the mace head, a record of the spoils of war can be seen, which reads 400,000 cattle, 1,422,000 goats, and 120,000 captives. Nama solidified his rule by strategically marrying a lower Egyptian princess named Nithotep, who became his queen and mother to his heir and successor, Horaha. The newly unified kingdom came to be known as the Two Lands among the ancient Egyptian people for most of their history. During his reign, Nama expanded his newly unified kingdom's borders with military excursions in Canaan to the north and in Nubia to the south. He founded the city of Memphis, which is strategically located at the mouth of the Nile Delta, and it quickly developed into a commercial and cultural powerhouse within the region. Symbols such as the Ankh, the ancient Egyptian symbol of life, and the Jed, a four-tiered pillar representing Osiris's spine, were popularized under his rule. Nama was entombed in a necropolis near the upper Egyptian city of Abydos, where the tombs of many of Egypt's first rulers are found. Through blood and conquest, Nama became Egypt's first pharaoh, initiating the early dynastic period. Out of the collapse of the old kingdom, there emerged the figure of a king again. This was Mentuhotep, the first to reunify all of Egypt. Mentuhotep referred to himself as uniter of the two lands, and the first part of his reign saw fighting and military campaigns aimed at crushing any cities that dared revolt against his rule. Mentuhotep I is really one of these very dynamic rulers of Egypt, really one of the greatest pharaohs, because he comes at a time when Egypt was uh, divided internally, politically fragmented. And during his reign, he succeeded in reunifying Egypt, laying the groundwork for this period during which Egypt again uh, becomes highly organized and centralized, and the kingship becomes uh, very powerful. The pharaoh Mentuhotep ruled from Thebes, which was now the capital city, and a site that would one day be known for its temples of Karnak and Luxor. Even in Mentuhotep's time, this was a large and powerful city. The ancients referred to it as the city of a thousand gates. As a building project, 
It reflected the stability and prosperity that Egypt once again enjoyed under the pharaoh Mentuhotep. But Mentuhotep was not seen as a god king like his predecessors had been during the time of the pyramids. To reflect this, he would erect a new style of mortuary temple for himself before an impressive backdrop of cliffs here in ancient Thebes at a site named Dar el Bahari. The complex was dug into the rock, a blend of traditional mastaba and pyramid of a god. This style of tomb building oddly confirms the power of Mentuhotep's rule. He was a half divine and half mortal leader. Underneath the temple, a larger than life size stone statue of the pharaoh Mentuhotep was found. He is seated and depicted in his hebsed robe, the robe he would have worn at the festival of his renewal. Nearby was uncovered an inscription of his queen named Kawit. Here she is depicted eternally having her hair arranged by a servant. Another artifact from the tomb depicts the princess Ashed, relaxing as she enjoys the fragrance of a lotus blossom. Such scenes underline this period of peace and stability, a period that would continue under a pharaoh who would change the way Egypt viewed its rulers forever. Pharaoh Amos I, a member of the Theban royal line and the son of Pharaoh Tau II, Amos I became the founder of the 18th dynasty of Egypt which is often referred to as the greatest of the Egyptian dynasties. At the age of seven, Amos' father was killed, and at the age of ten, his brother, having only ruled for three years, died of unknown causes. Afterwards, Amos assumed the throne and gained the title of Nes Petty Rey, meaning the Lord's strength is Rey. During his reign, Amos I was able to expel the Hyksos, which was something that his father and grandfather were not able to accomplish. This success allowed for the 18th dynasty to become an all African ruled dynasty. Almost the first restored the Theban rule, Egyptian culture and politics, and reasserted Egyptian power in its former territories of Nubia and Canaan. He also reopened quarries, mines, and trade routes. Massive construction projects began to take place, which allowed for the building of the last pyramid built by native Egyptians. Almost the first was a visionary, a brave nationalist, and a lover of his people and his culture. His bravery opened the doors for an African center Egypt until the fall of the 18th dynasty. Almost the first stood for justice and freedom, which he displayed by removing the foreign invaders known as the Hyksos. He showed pride and courage to free his people from oppression and inspired his people to live free and be proud to be an African. Amos the first, we proudly stand on your show. So, so um, that was wonderful. Amosi, Mentu Hotep, and Nama, or also known as Menace, great, powerful black men that um, actually ruled Egypt and took it from a small idea into a major major well-loved society that we know today um before i finish and show you so now before it ends i'm going to show you the document the snippet of the national Ge geographic documentary that i showed you at the beginning now you've had a lot more information you should be able to see the documentary a bit differently the problem with um, documentaries in Europe, America, um, is that they Europeanize everything, the majority of the words and everything. So when you're watching it, you can end up being confused. Um, I hope that I have informed you a bit more. So the next time you watch a documentary, you're like, "Oh, that's oh, that's McKim, and that's from McKim. Oh, oh, these are that's Ta Shemel or Ta Miha or." Um, this is Land of the Reed, this is Papyrus, this, this is, oh, they, they, oh that's R-M-O-C, that's the Unk, T-T-Unk-Amun, it's not Tutankhamun, it's T-T, 
Ankh Amun. So there's more information for you to be able to see past the mistruths that they come with in a lot of the documentaries that they have. A lot of them are very informative and they do have the truth, but because it's all broken up and they don't tell you the full story, you get it can be a bit it can be a bit confusing. Prime example of that of this is Per Ah, Pharaoh for every everybody knows Pharaoh and um knows about the, the um the pharaohs and we all talk about the pharaohs but that name only came about in the new kingdom when you're watching a documentary they will talk about pharaohs from the old kingdom and the middle kingdom and call them pharaoh but that is not their name it's sarah tawi or and that is the the title and they each had their um own names so it's better to delve into that history properly um, and get a more concise history. Um, and the way to do that, the internet, my friends, we live in this modern te technology world where you can go on the internet and do as much research. The reason why I have come up with all this information is because when I was going to start this lecture, let's say, I decided to do the research and the research just led me in places that you are seeing today um all, as i was going to say per r is the the moon and is the house of the moon so just know that when you're saying pharaoh you are saying house of r and the reason why you are saying house of the moon is because of our mercy he was born of r and after him in the new kingdom as the pharaoh the name pharaoh came about in the new kingdom after him everyone was a similar representative of him he was the next king was the next per r the next armosi the next man to bring Amun to the masses and bring prosperity to the ancient egyptians so that is the end of this let's say lesson forward slash lecture um, I have been JC Kamal. Uh, big up to the Portobello Hive and all of those collective, collectively wonderful people. Big up to Steam Co. Thank you for your help. It has been much appreciated. And hopefully, we can do many, many more parts to this uh, wonderful story that is ancient Egypt in the future. Because this is only a snippet. This was, I had to really condense all the information and not come with all the information that I have acquired in the future. When this COVID-19 is over and we can get out there into actual auditoriums and we can congregate to people as opposed to just two people in the room, um, then I hope to see you all um, when I'm able to do this lecture in four. As I said, I'm going to leave you with a snippet of this documentary from National Geographic. Hopefully you will have more information to be more informed and clued up. Bye. Mess up. Shukran. Okay, JC, bear with me because I'm going to have to find that clip again, but we'll have to edit this out. Just a sec. It's right at the end. Well, if we're going to edit it out, I could just edit another way. I'm supposed to first. Math, yeah, specifically, so math I had before. Gold Four hour division after this. Of we didn't go out loud. After this. And created a yeah, dam. So this, no, this is an irrigation. Yeah, okay, so let's okay, so just get a quiet bit. Okay, yeah, stand by, stand by. To this day, 
Structures like the Great Pyramids are a testament to the role of religion in ancient Egyptians' lives. But they also represent the innovative and cultural might of the Egyptian people. Innovations in mathematics and written language in particular propelled their civilization to success. Math, specifically measurement mathematics, helped Egyptians understand and harness their world with numbers like no other civilization had before. They developed a new form of measurement called the cubit. It was used to design massive structures such as the Great Pyramid with remarkable geometrical precision. The Egyptians also measured time. By combining mathematics with astronomy, they established a 24-hour division to the day and created a solar calendar, which was the first dating system in history to feature 365 days in one year. Lastly, Egyptians developed methods to measure and survey land around the Nile River. These civil engineering feats made way for the construction of dams, canals, and irrigation systems that helped farming and agriculture to flourish in the Nile Valley. In addition to mathematical concepts, the ancient Egyptians also created written languages to describe the world around them. The oldest and probably most well-known of these is hieroglyphic writing. This system was developed around 3150 BC during the Old Kingdom and has over 700 pictorial characters. It was used to inscribe monuments and pottery and predominantly served a decorative or ceremonial purpose. Soon after, another ancient form of writing, called hieratic, developed out of the hieroglyphic system. It was a form of cursive that was written in ink and served a more functional purpose. Unlike its more formal predecessor, hieratic was written on another ancient Egyptian innovation, papyrus. Papyrus was a type of paper derived from the papyrus plant, which grew plentifully along the Nile River. This medium gave the ancient Egyptians a new avenue of communication and record keeping that allowed their civilization's administrative skill to grow and their culture to spread for thousands of years.